today's session, we are going to look at various images captured by the James Webb Space Telescope, which is one of the most powerful telescopes in operation currently. And also at various other images which are not captured by this telescope. So our objective uh, of this webinar would be to familiarize ourselves with the very basics of astronomy. And uh, furthermore, this is supposed to be a highly interactive session, okay? And uh, we would love to see your involvement in the chat box. So uh, feel free to discuss uh, a particular related topic or drop in your questions in the chat box whenever you feel like. And we will try to take up a few questions in between uh, and try to answer them. And also depending on the availability of time, we may also take a, a few questions at the end. Okay, so interaction is very much important for this session to be a success. And we will also have a quick photo session towards the end. So make sure you don't miss out on that as we would love to see all your smiling pictures uh, on our social media platform. And finally, we will also announce our upcoming events towards the end. And um, I hope you all are excited for this cosmic journey. And let's get started. I guess uh, Pravesh, you have already started the recording, right? Yeah, it's started. Okay, so let's begin. Yes, so the title of the talk, Introduction to Astronomy Through the Eyes of JWST. So here, JWST stands for the James Webb Space Telescope. And to begin with, let us look at the first image, the very first image, which was captured by the James Webb Space Telescope. So on the screen that you're seeing now is the first image, which was captured roughly a year ago uh, by the James Webb Space Telescope. And this is what the image is. So let us try to understand what this image is about. So just imagine uh, you're holding a grain of rice in your hand. You are holding a grain of rice in your hand and you are pointing it at the sky at night, at a random place in the sky, okay? So, this particular image is basically that small portion of the sky with which, uh, with which you are actually pointing at the sky, okay? So, in this very own, uh, in this uh, image that you are screen, uh, seeing on the screen, you are seeing thousands of galaxies, except for a few stars, these, these are few stars. But except for these uh, objects like these, every other dot or every other object that you are seeing in this image is a galaxy. And in this very image, you are seeing thousands of galaxies. Okay. And our Milky Way has roughly 10 to the power 11 stars. It has billions, uh, billions of stars, our own Milky Way. And as you can see, in this small picture, we have thousands of galaxies. So this very small picture it contains trillions of stars okay so the patch of the sky of the size of a rice grain contains almost trillions of stars trillions as in 10 to the power 12 so just imagine how many stars are there in our entire universe okay and then the most obvious question is are we alone well for now we have not detected any alien species, but looking at the size of our universe, looking at the number of stars in our universe, we can definitely expect that there may be some alien life hiding somewhere. Okay. So let's look at uh, the telescope which has captured this image. So this is the JWST telescope. And uh, as you can see, uh, this is a three mirror telescope. So this is the first mirror, the primary mirror. This is the secondary mirror and there is another tertiary mirror which is behind this primary mirror and there is a fourth mirror which is just a plain mirror. So uh, these first three mirrors, the primary, secondary and the tertiary which is behind this, these are curved mirrors. Okay, these are curved mirrors but the fourth mirror is a plain mirror that we, similar to the one that we use at our homes, which is a plain mirror. So this telescope contains basically three curved mirrors and a fourth plain mirror. Okay. So how do uh, how how does this telescope capture the light coming from an object? So light coming from an object, it first falls onto the primary mirror. Okay. After reflection from the primary mirror is go it goes onto the secondary mirror, and again it gets reflected from the secondary mirror onto the tertiary mirror, which is the third mirror. And finally, after again reflection from the tertiary mirror, it falls onto the fourth mirror, and Again, one more re reflection takes place and finally it goes on to the detector which is behind this primary mirror. Okay, 
So there are mm-hmm. lots of reflection there. There are basically three mirrors, three third mirrors, primary, secondary, tertiary, and finally one flat mirror. So after these many reflections, the light is finally collected onto the detector. So now there must be a question like, why to use so many mirrors? Why not use one mirror? Why not use two mirrors? Why are we using like this three mirror curve system? So the answer is uh, basically, uh, if you'll uh, go for higher studies and learn optics, you'll uh, you'll come to know that three mirror system is sufficient to give a very uh, a, what a very clear image. Okay, if you do, if you just uh, use a single mirror. Uh, it will have some distortions. If you use two mirrors, there will still be some distortion, but uh, it will be lesser compared to the first case. But if you use three mirrors, it is the best possible image that uh, is possible theoretically. So that is why we use a three mirror system. And the fourth mirror is just to uh, deflect the light rays onto the detector. That is why we use a three mirror system. Okay. Next. Uh, you are seeing that the primary mirror is plated with gold. Okay, you are seeing gold color here. So basically, this primary mirror is made up of beryllium. Okay, and the coating on the beryllium is made up of gold. The mirrors are made up of beryllium because beryllium is a sturdy structure, so it should not get damaged. That is why it is made up of beryllium and it is coated with gold because gold is a good reflector of infrared light. Gold is a good reflector of infrared light. Now, why am I talking about infrared light? Because our telescope, the JWST, it observes infrared light. It observes infrared light. Now, what is infrared light? So, we all know that light is a wave. Okay. And we see different colors of light. Okay. But that is only a small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. We have many different kinds of light rays. For example, radio waves. You must have heard about ultraviolet rays, infrared rays, microwave, X-rays, gamma rays. These are all different forms of light rays. Okay. And our telescope is primarily watching infrared light. Okay. And gold is a good reflector of infrared light. And that is why the mirrors are coated with gold. Next, Uh, what you are seeing in this uh, image is... Okay. Uh, does the gold uh, not gam- not get damaged? Uh, does the gold not get damaged? Okay. Yeah. So uh, as we uh, know that this is a space-based telescope. Okay. So there are lots of uh, objects like uh, rocks and uh, stuff like that, uh, which I, which can actually damage the telescope. Okay. So it is definitely possible that. Uh, uh, objects like uh, these rocks which are floating out in outer space they may damage and that is why i was coming to the next point of this particular uh, object so this is a shield okay so this is also the telescope mount and this is also the shield okay so what happens is this uh, the purpose of the shield is to protect the telescope body from damages and damage does not happen only from uh, the stone the damage can also happen from sunlight the damage can also happen from light which is coming from the moon. The, la- the damage can also happen from the light which is coming from the earth. Because uh, earth is also emitting light. Moon is also emitting light. Sun is also emitting light. As in, okay, so the purpose of this shield is to protect our telescope's body from uh, from this harmful radiation. Okay. And uh, further, uh, this gold thing, it can be damaged by rocks. But if uh, there are some systems which are able to correct for any small damages, but if the damage is uh, a lot more, then uh, of course the, teles- the telescope can be damaged permanently. But that is one of the reasons that if you are uh, seeing that our primary mirror uh, is made up of these, these hexagonal segments. Okay, so uh, why are why was the primary mirror made up of such hexagonal segments? So one. Uh, primary reason is that it is easier to manufacture uh, tiny tiny mirrors rather than make one large mirror so the size of our telescope is size of this primary mirror is six and a half meters okay this is a very large mirror okay so it's very difficult to fabricate a very large mirror and that is why uh, it is easier to make such small units and then assemble them together okay but 
uh, another reason is as uh, as the question has been pointed out that what if the telescope uh, mirror gets damaged okay so if one of the units get damaged it's still fine because the other units are functioning properly okay so that is also one of the reason uh, why this telescope mirror has been made up of different segments i hope i have answered the question um, are there any more questions pravesh yeah Ishan is asking, can you please please explain the mirror system with a diagram? Okay, uh, it's very difficult to draw a diagram in the limited space I have, but let me just show it to you again. Uh, so uh, let us say light is coming from this side. Okay, I'm drawing it in white. If light is coming from this side, uh, we have this uh, primary mirror here. Okay which is curved in this particular fashion, okay? So then what happens when light falls onto this primary mirror, it gets reflected in this fashion and it falls onto the secondary mirror, which is here. I'm drawing the mirror in the red color. So this is the secondary mirror and this is the primary mirror, okay? Uh, again, now after reflection from the secondary mirror, uh, again, uh, so after reflection, the light will come back again in this particular fashion. And there is a small hole, which is this black colored portion that you can see. There's a small hole in the primary mirror. So light will enter through this small hole in the primary mirror. And there is the tertiary mirror at the back. Okay. And again, finally, after refraction from this tertiary mirror, this is the tertiary mirror here in red. And again, after reflection from the tertiary mirror, it will fall onto the secondary mirror, uh, onto the fourth mirror, which is just the flat mirror, which is placed behind the primary mirror. and Finally, sorry, and finally, after reflection from the flat mirror, it will go onto the detector, which is I have shown in blue here, and uh, that is how the reflection takes place. Okay, uh, and if you still want to know, I have drawn a very messy diagram here because of the limited space. But if you would like to know more, you can always uh, contact us or us on the WhatsApp group, and I'll be able, to, I'll be happy to share with the actual diagram of the. Uh, JWST mirror system. Okay. Um, so, can we move on, Pravesh? Yeah. Okay. So, as I pointed out, our uh, the primary mirror is six and a half meters in length. Okay. And so, let's look how the mirror looks compared to the human size. So, as you can see, there are these scientists which are trying to uh, look at the primary mirror and you can see that how large this particular mirror is and you can just then try to uh, comprehend how difficult it would have been to launch this uh, telescope system into space. So this is the size uh, of uh, six and a half meter. Okay. You must be familiar with the previous telescope, which was the Hubble Space Telescope. So Hubble Space Telescope had a, a diameter of 2.1 meter and our JWST has a diameter of 6.5 meter. So it is roughly three times uh, bigger compared to the Hubble Space Telescope, okay? And this mount that we were seeing in this uh, image, the size of this mount is of the order of uh, roughly the size of our tennis court, okay? So it's such a huge system and that is why it took a lot of money to actually manufacture, fabricate, and then further launch it into space. Right. So it took, I guess, few billion dollars to just uh, make this telescope operational. Now we can look at a different uh, side view of this telescope system. So as you can see, uh, this is the mount and this mount will always point in a direction uh, away from the sun, earth and moon. Okay. So this particular uh, system will try to shield the main body of the telescope uh, from the heat of the sun, moon and earth and all other objects. And as you can see, there are also few instruments uh, that are uh, attached to the uh, mount system and you can see a solar panel as well so this telescope also uses solar panel to uh, operate uh, to operate itself okay so now there are four major instruments which are assembled on this telescope uh, telescope system and we are not going to discuss all these uh, in detail but let me just give you a short idea what these instruments are so the first instrument is the miri which is the mid infrared uh, mid infrared region imager okay so that observes mid infrared light next is the nirspec 
which is the near infrared spectrograph what is the spectrograph we are going to talk about that and uh, and this particular imager is, imager is nothing but a detector kind of thing a telescope system which is used to collect light and obtain an image this is near spec which is a spectrograph uh, spectrograph i'll talk uh, in a while mircam is again a camera similar to miri but it works in the near infrared region okay and there is a system called fgs which is the fine guidance uh, guidance guidance sensor which is used to point the telescope at a particular object okay so we if we have to look at a particular object we should be able to align our telescopes appropriately appropriate in the appropriate direction and for that this fgs instrument is used so let's move on and a very obvious question that may have come to your minds is that why uh, do we need space based telescopes why is there a need for space based telescope we can set up telescopes on ground as well so why do we have to uh, spend so much money and uh, on such space based telescopes so there are two reasons the first primary reason is that uh, our earth atmosphere will allow only some portion of the light to pass through it all it will only allows visible light and radio light to pass through it okay and as i told you at the beginning that our telescope is observing in infrared region okay so our earth atmosphere it blocks most of the infrared light it only allows some infrared light to pass through it and since we want to observe infrared light uh, that is why we uh, send we have to send our telescope outside the earth uh, earth atmosphere the second reason is that our earth atmosphere is not stable okay the atmosphere the temperature it keeps on changing changing and as a result the atmosphere is not stable it keeps on uh, uh, having some turbulent motion it has its own temperature variations as well fluctuations and so on and that is why the image that we get using ground based telescopes it is not very clear so that is it keeps on moving it keeps on uh, distorting and that is why uh, we have to uh, send uh, telescopes outside our uh, earth atmosphere that is these are the two primary reasons uh, why we uh, send uh, telescopes outside the earth atmosphere okay so now let's get back to this first image uh, that was captured by the jwst and let us look at few of the properties okay so what we are actually seeing we are seeing a galaxy cluster at the center we are seeing a galaxy cluster at the center so this luminous thing object that you are seeing at the center is the galaxy cluster okay and the name of the galaxy cluster is smax 072 the name of this galaxy cluster is smax 072023 and it is a homework for you to identify what this smax actually means okay it is a nomenclature system it is a naming system and what this smax actually stand for is a homework thing for you so let us uh, understand what a galaxy cluster is first of all okay and to understand what a galaxy cluster is we need to understand what a galaxy actually is okay so let's start with our own a uh, very familiar galaxy which is the milky way so this is an artist image of a milky way it, and it is not the true image because we cannot go out and take selfies right so this is an artist image uh, very far away from the center of the galaxy somewhere here is our sun and somewhere near the sun is our earth and so that is uh, what is happening that our sun and many such uh, stellar system these uh, all these dots that you are seeing in this image these are all stars and these stars are revolving around these uh, around this gala luminous bright center that you are seeing okay so now wh why do these stars revolve around this galactic center so the obvious reason is gravitational pull so you know that earth and other planets they revolve around the sun because of the gravitational force so in a similar way because of the strong gravity of this central region okay the other stars that you are seeing in this image they revolve around this uh, galactic center okay so now what a galaxy basically is so a galaxy is basically a group of stars which are moving together because of the under the influence of a gravitational strong gravitational force okay let me repeat again so what is a galaxy a galaxy is a group of stars which are bound together under the influence of a strong gravitational force So that is what a galaxy is, a group of stars. Okay. Now, let us now look at a picture of another galaxy which is very near to our own galaxy, which is the Andromeda galaxy. So the picture on the left is the Milky Way galaxy, and the picture on the right is the Andromeda galaxy. Okay. 
and it is expected that four and half billion years later these two galaxies will collide these two galaxies will collide and now why will they collide again because milky way has its own mass andromeda has its own mass so they exert a gravitational force on each other and because of this gravitational force it is expected that four and half billion years later these two galaxies will collide and merge into one okay uh, we have so a question this, uh, yeah let me just complete this thing and i'll take a, take the question uh, so this is our milky way this is our andromeda galaxy okay and you are seeing very tiny galaxies which are revolving around the milky way okay and there are other other few tiny galaxies which are revolving around the andromeda galaxy okay so now why are these tiny galaxies revolving around the milky way again because of the gravitational force between these galaxies and similarly these galaxies they are also revolving around each other again because of the influence of gravitational force further these two groups these two small groups they are moving together because of the gravitational force and these this this entire structure it is bound together because of the gravitational force between them and that is why they form a structure or a group which is called a local group and this is nothing but a galaxy cluster so what is a galaxy cluster a galaxy cluster is a group of galaxies which are moving together under the influence of the gravitational force okay yes pravesh uh priya pranay and ishita asking the same question uh, they have known that in the center of the milky way galaxy there is a black hole but why is okay. it so bright in the image okay so that is a very interesting observation all three of you and uh, we are going to talk more about black hole and why uh, it is that the central portion is illuminated towards the end of this talk okay so black holes uh, is a concept that we are going to cover towards the end of this talk so we'll take up that question that time okay any other question pravesh no okay so let's move on and uh, please remind me if i forget to take up this question but i won't so let's look at another image which was captured by jwst so again uh, except for these star like objects okay except for the stars every other object that you are seeing in this image is a galaxy okay but there are few prominent galaxies which are visible so this is one galaxy this is second this is third this is fourth and this is fifth okay so there are five galaxies in this picture and you can see the third and the fourth galaxy these are actually merging together okay and uh, so it is expect as i told you it is expected after 4 and 1/2 billion years later milky way and andromeda are colli will collide but out there in our universe there are already many such galactic collisions happening and our jwst has been able to identify one such galactic collision okay now this uh, picture is named after an astronomer called stephen and uh, the name is basically stephen's quintet so this quintet actually means five so you must have heard singlet doublet triplet uh, four is quartet and five is quintet so that is why the name stephens quintet okay now let's come back to our image uh, which is this and let us uh, now look at something so what we know is that this galaxy cluster the light coming from this central galaxy cluster is 5 billion years old okay so the light coming from this galaxy cluster is 5 billion years old so let us assume that this image was captured today although it was captured roughly an uh, roughly a year ago but let us assume that this image was captured today okay and but the light coming from the galaxy cluster is not of today it is 5 billion years old because the galaxy cluster is very far from us light from that object will take some time to reach the telescope so how much time is it taking it is taking 5 billion years for the light from the galaxy cluster to reach the telescope okay and that is why this galaxy cluster is very far away few light a uh, few billion light years away from us so even if we assume that the galaxy cluster is 5 billion light years away we light years away this is a very far distance okay so this is not how the galaxy cluster looks like today it looks like this it look like this 5 billion years ago and it is 
roughly 5 billion year light years away from us okay not exactly 5 billion light years but let us assume that it is 5 billion light years away so now how much is this distance i am not we are not able to imagine this right so let us understand what a light year is basically so as the name suggests light year okay light year so it is nothing but the distance traveled by light in one year light year is nothing but the distance traveled by light in one year and what is distance basically distance is you all know that mathematically it is speed multiplied by time right distance is nothing but speed multiplied by time okay so what speed we should take we should take the speed of the light okay and what year should we take we should take one year because we are trying to calculate one what is one light year okay so on the left hand side we are trying to calculate one light year and on the right hand side we have speed into time so the speed of light is 3 into 10 power 5 kilometers per second 3 into 10 power 5 kilometers per second okay that is the speed of light that is 3 lakh kilometer per second now we should multiply this quantity by one year we should multiply this quantity by one year to get what one light year is so now let's break up one year so one year as we know is made up of 365 days one year is made up of 365 days one day is made up of 24 hours one day is made up of 24 hours one hour is made up of 60 minutes one hour is made up of 60 minutes and finally one minute is made up of 60 seconds one minute is made up of 60 seconds so when you multiply all these numbers you will get what one light year is in terms of kilometers so when you actually do the multiplication it will come out to be approximately 9.46 into 10 power 12 kilometers so that is basically one light year okay but our galaxy cluster was 5 billion light years away right 5 billion light years away so when you do the calculation it turns out to be roughly 4.73 into 10 power 22 kilometers so approximately you just write 5 and 22 zeros kilometer away so just imagine how far the galaxy cluster is and to give a comparison our earth circumference is only 40000 km so if you have to go around the earth it will take roughly 40000 km and that uh, so you can just compare these two numbers okay so how big that difference is so we will have to make so many rotations uh, of the uh, revolutions of the earth just to uh, reach that galaxy cluster okay so let's again come back to our image and one peculiar thing that we can observe in this image are the distorted galaxies around the center there are some distorted galaxies around the center let me point out a few so as you can see here you are seeing a distorted galaxy this is a distorted galaxy this is a distorted galaxy this is a distorted galaxy here is another distorted galaxy so as you can see they are forming kind of a circular pattern uh, around this galaxy cluster okay and so why why it is happening we'll try to understand so uh, before we understand why the galaxies are distorted uh, let us all imagine like you are sitting in your room and you are trying to observe your ceiling fan okay so how are we able to observe the ceiling fan it is because the light coming from the ceiling fan enters our eyes the light coming from the ceiling fan enters our eyes so to ob uh, look at any other object we have the light from that particular object should enter our eyes okay this is how we observe any particular object but what if somebody comes and places an opaque cardboard in between your eyes and the ceiling fan if somebody comes and places an opaque object in between your eyes and the ceiling fan now will you be able to observe the ceiling fan the answer is obviously no because the light coming from the ceiling fan has been blocked by the cardboard and that is why the light coming from the ceiling fan cannot enter our eyes and we won't be able to observe the ceiling fan okay now let's get back to our image and uh, these and i'll give you i'll uh, i'll make a statement now that these distorted galaxies they are, their position is not actually this whatever position that you are seeing these galaxies this is not their true position okay these distorted galaxies most of them are actually behind the galaxy cluster okay so let me explain you with a diagram so let us assume that this is our telescope here 
at uh, at this particular point is our galaxy cluster and the distorted galaxies are somewhere behind okay and the distorted galaxies are very small compared to the galaxy cluster okay so ideally what should happen uh, the, these galaxies they emit light in all possible directions okay but now uh, the light rays coming from uh, towards the telescope they are blocked by this galaxy cluster the light rays coming from this galaxy uh, is blocked actually by the galaxy cluster and ideally our telescope should not be able to observe the gal the distorted galaxy which is behind but it is still able to observe those galaxies which are behind and let us understand how so this is the image basically that i was trying to tell you uh, this is the position of the telescope this is the distant galaxy and this is a galaxy cluster okay so this distant galaxy is emitting light in all possible directions but as you can see some of the light it is traveling towards the galaxy cluster okay along this particular path but the galaxy cluster is a very massive object it is made up of so many stars so many galaxies and that is why this will have a very strong gravitational influence on the light this will have a very strong gravitational influence on the light and what it will do it will try to bend the light it will actually bend the light that is coming from this distant galaxy and finally what is happening this bent light is actually then now moving towards the telescope and then it is captured finally captured so despite this galaxy distant galaxy being behind this galaxy cluster the strong gravitational influence of this galaxy cluster is bending the light coming from this distant galaxy and descending towards the telescope so the distorted galaxies that you are actually seeing are the galaxies which are behind the galaxy cluster and because of this strange phenomenon they are appearing to us as distorted galaxies okay now uh, this phenomenon looks something like what you have studied in school right uh, so when uh, if you have a lens okay a glass lens and when light falls onto a glass lens what happens it bend bends right okay depending on whether the lens is concave or convex it will either converge or diverge okay so basically what happens light bends so in this case also light is bending as you can see in this particular region so this galaxy cluster is acting like a lens and that is why this phenomenon is called the phenomenon of gravitational lensing okay let us now uh, move on uh, uh, move again back to our image which is the image uh, captured by the first image of jwst and the point that we are going to now observe is that the red color of galaxies so if we ignore these stars these stars appear bluish to us but most of the galaxies that you are seeing are reddish or yellowish or orange in color so let us understand why why the red color of uh, why do we see uh, galaxies mostly of red in color okay and the simple answer to this question is the expansion of the universe okay our universe that we are in it is not of a fixed shape and size okay this our our universe is it is growing and growing it is expanding okay and now we'll try to understand why this expansion is causing the red color of galaxies okay so as i told you light is a electromagnetic field so assume this is a light wave and the distance between these two topmost points distance between these two topmost points is called the wavelength the distance between the bottommost point is also called the wavelength or distance between any two similar positioned points is also called the wavelength of the light but for simplicity let us assume the distance between these two topmost points of the light wave is the wavelength of the light okay now we have different kinds of light so in the visible region we have a uh, light from violet indigo indigo blue green yellow orange and red so there's this uh, fact that red color has a longer wavelength and blue color has a shorter wavelength red color light has a longer wavelength and blue colored light has a shorter wavelength to be precise in the visible region okay i am reminding you our telescope is not observing in the visible region it is observing in the infrared region but i am just trying to explain you by giving an analogy with the visible region so that you are able to understand it properly okay so the wavelength of red light is roughly 700 nanometer and wavelength of blue light is 400 nanometer so as you can see 700 is greater than 400 okay 
so we have this light wave which is coming from an object let us say galaxy and it is traveling in space and as you can see the distance between these two points is called the wavelength of the light okay so now when this light wave coming from the galaxy when it will pass through space to reach our telescope what will happen during that time the universe is expanding right so because the universe is expanding the wavelength of the light will also expand the light wave will also expand and the wavelength will increase as is shown in the image so let us assume uh, there is a galaxy here okay there is a galaxy here and there is a telescope at this position so even if the galaxy emits the galaxy will emit all kinds of light not just blue light it will emit all different colors of light okay uh, even if we assume the galaxy emits blue light by the time the light it reaches even if it uh, emits blue light by the time the light reaches our telescope the wavelength of the light will have increased and will detect light as red in color okay that is because of the expansion of the universe the expansion of the universe causes the light to uh, the wavelength of the light to expand okay so let us look at this image we have this galaxy here at the center of our image and let us first assume that the galaxy is uh, let us assume that the gal galaxy is moving towards right okay the galaxy is moving towards right and let us first assume that we are observing it from here okay so now what will happen when this galaxy will go away from us the light waves emitted by this galaxy it, those light waves will get stretched and as a result the galaxy will appear reddish but if on the other hand so we look at from this point of view from this point of view the galaxy is actually now moving towards us okay so as a result the the light wave will now get compressed okay the light wave will now get compressed and as a result uh, if we are observing from this side the wavelength of light will decrease okay so depending on where you are observing uh, we'll see different colors of galaxies okay but most galaxies appear reddish because most galaxies are moving away from each, away from us and also from each other and that is why most galaxies appear reddish so if there were, there are any galaxies which are moving towards us they'll appear bluish so this phenomenon is called redshift or blue shift okay uh so pravesh uh, are there any yeah. questions now we have questions okay. uh, johnny is asking can gravity affect the light can gravity affect the light yeah yes so uh, as i pointed out uh, earlier that in this particular image uh, the gravitational force of this galaxy cluster is bending the light right so in direct so yes it is the gravitational force of this galaxy is affecting the light it is affecting the light by changing its path okay so what actually is happening actually the space around this galaxy cluster it is getting bent the space is getting bent and as a result we know that light always travels in a straight line but the space itself gets bent and as a result it seems to us that light is bending along the uh, space yes pravesh uh, any more questions uh, is the term multiverse true is the term multiverse true uh, well theoret there have been uh, theoretical predictions about it but so far we don't have any observational uh, evidence uh, to the existence of multi um, uh, what is the name of our galaxy cluster what is the uh, it is the local group which i pointed out at the beginning a few slides back yeah so our galaxy cluster is called the local group and it comes with the uh, group of andromeda as well okay so andromeda is also a part of our galaxy cluster which is the local group okay so jeet is asking if light is bending can we uh, say it is refraction uh if light is bending can we, can we say it is refraction uh yes actually it is uh, similar to refraction but uh, refraction is a phenomenon which takes place when light travels from one medium to another okay so now uh, let me come back to this image okay so there are two images this is the top image and this is the bottom image let us look at the top image in this case what is happening 
the light rays are getting bent okay because of the gravitational force the medium is not changing this is light is still traveling in vacuum itself okay so the medium is vacuum the medium in which light is traveling is a vacuum so in this case the phenomenon is a bit different and that is why this phenomenon is called gravitational lens but in the phenomenon uh, pointed in the, in the bottom diagram what is happening and light is traveling from vacuum to glass this is glass right so when light is traveling from vacuum to glass that is why it is getting bent so this phenomenon is called refraction so although the phenomena appear similar they are actually different okay one happens because of the gravitational force and the other phenomenon happens because of the change in the medium through which light is traveling Ishita is asking how did astronomers find out universe is expanding how did astronomers find out that universe is expanding that is a very uh, brilliant question and uh, to answer that uh, we'll have to understand what spectroscopy is so we'll cover that in a few slides so i'll try to answer that uh, question in a few slides and one more question ashvin is asking can we use big celestial object as a lens to capture far away objects more efficiently uh, to capture far away objects more more efficiently yes definitely that is a very nice uh, observation so yes uh, we are uh, using this phenomenon of gravitational lensing we are able to detect objects which are not which, which are not directly visible so for example uh, in this image itself uh, this is a distant galaxies which ideally would not have been visible to our telescope here but because of the presence of this galaxy cluster we are able to observe this distant galaxy and this phenomenon is definitely used to observe uh, uh, to predict the existence of objects which are not directly visible but can be visible because of this phenomenon uh, athar is asking since the universe is expanding so the distance between all the galaxies should also increase so why are we predicting that our galaxy will merge okay so that is a, a a very wonderful question so there are two things happening okay so one is the expansion of the universe let me just write down one is expansion of the universe and another is the force of gravitation right so there are two things happening so because of the expansion galaxy galaxies are moving away from each other and because of gravitation they are coming towards each other each other okay but as we know that gravitation uh, the force of gravitation it decreases on increasing in distance right we uh, we you must have studied in school that the formula for gravitational force is g m1 m2 by r square so this r is nothing but the distance between the two objects so as the distance between the two objects increases the gravitational force becomes very weak so at that time expansion dominates so the galaxies which are very far from us they'll keep on moving away from us but the galaxies which are near to us they'll come towards us because the gravitational force is strong so it depends which particular entity is in is the more influential one if the gravitational force is influential the galaxies will come together if the a uh, entity which is causing the expansion if that is more influential the galaxies will move away from each other uh, uh, the merging of so two guess, galaxies uh, could be affect our solar system uh does the merging of two galaxies affect our solar system uh well uh, actually it should not it is a very tiny possibility that it will affect the solar system or the life that exists. exists on earth for example if milky way and uh, andromeda collides basically uh, not much change will happen in the uh, solar system or the earth that is because most of the space between these galaxies is vacuum okay only a small amount of space is occupied by stars earth and uh, stars planets and other objects so if the uh, when they are actually colliding actually the material is not colliding okay just the centers of these two galaxies are merging and most of the materials will actually pass through the empty space in between so not much distortion will happen most of the phenomenon will happen uh, towards the center and it won't affect objects which are very far away from the galactic center 
Uh, so can we move on? We are a short. Uh, we are short on yes, time, yes. and if there are if there is time left, so we'll uh, take questions towards the end. Uh, so let's look at another image which was captured by JWST, which is the image of exoplanet Wasp ninety six B. Now again, why this Wasp name is given? That is a homework. And let us now understand what an exoplanet is. So an exoplanet is a planet which is outside our solar system. So a planet which is revolving around a different star other than the sun is called an exoplanet. So in this image, uh, this is a star and this is the planet. Okay, and this is not a true image. This is an artist image. But the actual true image is this particular graph that you are seeing. Here. Okay, so uh, this graph on the y-axis you see that it is written amount of light blocked. And on the x-axis, we have wavelength of light. So this graph is called a spectrum. This graph is called a spectrum. And using this spectrum, we are uh, able to identify that there are water molecules present on the surface of uh, on the atmosphere of this planet in the atmosphere of this planet. Okay, the light that was captured by the telescope. That light is coming from the atmosphere of this planet, okay. And based on the spectrum of the light, what is spectrum? We'll uh, talk shortly. But this is nothing but the spectrum. And based on this spectrum, we are able to predict that this planet's atmosphere has traces of water in it. And that is why this is another exciting image that was captured by the telescope. So now let us understand what a spectrum is basically. So we are all aware of the phenomenon of this uh, of the prism, right? That when sunlight, which is made up of all the colors, when it is passed through prism, it split and it splits into it into its constituent colors. Okay, violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, and red. So this phenomenon of splitting, this splitting is called spectrum. The splitting of light, the dispersion of the light, is called spectrum. And as you can see, this these bands are continuous bands. There are no gaps in between. That is why. This is called a continuous spectrum. Okay, but now when you try to observe these bands using a microscope, okay, what we actually see, we actually see something like this, a pattern like this. So we see that there are many black lines present. These bands that appeared continuous to us, these are not actually continuous, but these are discontinuous bands. There are many black lines present. So what is happening? What is black basically? What is the color black? Color black is the absence of light, right? So, what we are actually seeing that some wavelength. So on the uh, x-axis that you are seeing, that is the wavelength, right? So some lines are missing, some colors are missing, right? That means some wavelength of light is missing from this spectrum. So, based on this pattern, we are able to predict what elements are present in the source. So this is the sun. This is the sunlight, right? And this is the spectrum of the sun. This is the spectrum of the sun. So based on the position of these missing lines, we are able to predict which elements are present in the atmosphere of the sun. Okay. And these lines, these uh, missing lines, these patterns are actually very unique, just like our fingerprints. So the fingerprints of two human beings cannot be same. Similarly, uh, the spectrum of different elements is unique. For example. If uh, you look at the spectrum of hydrogen, okay. So what do what do I mean by the spectrum of hydrogen? So let us uh, assume that there is a box and you fill this box with hydrogen gas, okay. Fill this box with hydrogen gas and then you send light through this transparent transparent box. Assume this is a transparent box and you send light through this box and then when you collect this light uh, from this transparent hydrogen box and then you send it through a prism. What will happen? This will this light will split, and you'll get a pattern similar to this. Okay, you'll get a pattern similar to this. Okay, this is hydrogen gas in the uh, box. Okay, so this pattern that is formed will be very unique. Now, if we if you replace the gas with uh, if you replace the hydrogen gas with some other gas, you'll get a similar pattern, but a very different one. As in, the position of the black lines will now change for the spectrum of helium. Okay. So that is how we are able to predict what elements are present in the atmosphere of the object that we are trying to observe. These patterns are very unique, and this the and this study is basically called spectroscopy. And this spectroscopy is 
actually gives uh, gives lot more information it does not just tells us which elements are present it also tells us about uh, the temperature of the object it also tells us uh, helps us to identify the distance of the object and uh, there was one question as well right how do we know that the galaxies are moving away from each other so based on this spectrum itself there is a mathematical formula i am not going to go deep into that but based on the spectrum itself we are able to tell that the galaxies are actually moving away from each other okay so uh, let's move on and now get back to the image that we were interested in so this as you can see is the spectrum basically so on the y axis you are seeing amount of light block and on the x axis you are seeing the wavelength of light so this graph basically tells us which particular color of light is getting absorbed and which color of light is uh, reaching us okay so on the basis of this we are able to tell that water is actually present in the atmosphere of the planet okay now let us look how this exoplanets are actually detected okay so these exoplanets are actually very small we are observing a star which is very far away so it appears very small the stars appear very small to the telescope okay further the planets are themselves smaller than the uh, star around which they are rotating okay so what happens sometime most of the time the telescope is not able to directly detect the small planet okay so uh, so our telescope uses a method called as transit light curve to detect uh, an exoplanet so how it is done so let me draw a diagram here so let us assume uh, this is our star okay i'll draw it in red this is our star okay and we have a planet in blue okay right here which is orbiting this star we have this planet which is in blue in color which is orbiting this star and this is the position of our telescope t okay so when this planet is outside when this planet is outside this year uh, what happens the light coming from the star is getting collected by the telescope okay but now when this planet starts entering in between so when the planet starts entering in between what happens it tries to block the light coming from the star it is since it is very small in size it is not able to block the light completely but a small portion of this light is blocked by this exoplanet so that is what is shown in the diagram so when the planet here was outside uh, light was getting collected by the telescope from this star but when the planet now starts entering in between the telescope and the star the intensity of the light falls when it is completely in it uh, it remains constant and once it starts going out it uh, the intensity of the light again increases and once it's finally outside the intensity of light again becomes constant so this is one of the methods uh, which is used to detect uh, an exoplanet a planet which is outside our solar system okay are there any questions pravesh uh, not new questions okay fine so now let us look at another question uh, sorry another image which was shared by the jwst uh, that image is of the karina nebula of course not named after karina kapoor but what a nebula is a nebula is a region of dense hot gas in which star formation takes place a nebula is a region of dense gas in which star formation takes place so all the tiny dots that you are seeing every single dot on this image is a star and these are basically newly formed stars these are so stars are basically newly formed stars okay let us look at a very famous image the, the image on the left and image on the right is of the same nebula which is called the pillars of creation the left image was captured by the hubble space telescope okay and the right side image was captured by jwst okay so now as you can see the number of stars that you are seeing on the image on the right hand side is more right as you can see there are lot many stars compared to the image on the left so why is this because hubble observes in visible region hubble observes in visible region and jwst observes in infrared region so now nebula is a region of gas as i told you so what happens Uh, when light is emitted from different stars 
this gas it tries to absorb the light coming from the star so this gas is able to observe most of the visible light and that is why it is we are able to see only a few stars to the left but since the wavelength uh, of infrared light is more it is the gas is not able to actually absorb it uh, sufficiently and that is why we are able to see lots and lots of stars in this image which was captured by jwst okay and this image is known as the pillars of creation so now why this name pillars pillars is given it is evident from the diagram that you are seeing this pillar kind of structure and these pillars are very tall like few hundred light years at, at least few thousand hundred or thousand light years in length so these are very tall structures okay again you are seeing these these are the pillars and why the name creation okay as i told you nebula are star forming regions the stars are getting created that is why the name creation okay but not just stars okay not just stars for earth to exist for life on earth to exist we know that sunlight is a very powerful source of energy so if the sun would not have been there we would not have survived okay so similarly it is quite possible that not just stars are getting created but maybe these are also the sources of alien life and that is why the name pillars of creation okay so that is why uh, you can see that infrared astronomy is important as well because infrared uh, light can give more information so it is not always true so depending on the object that uh, we observe a uh, few objects are uh, well visible in visible region few objects are well visible in infrared region and few objects are visible in radio and so on so all different domains of astronomy uh, are equally important uh moving on to the next image captured uh, by okay pravesh yeah. how these pillars are formed today how these pillars are formed formed okay so again the answer is gravity so uh, this uh, this is actually basically gas as i told you so gas also has some mass it is made up of uh, gas molecules like hydrogen mostly hydrogen okay so what happens these hydrogen molecules they try to come together uh, because of the gravitational force and the, wherever the gravitational force is strong uh, the molecules will try to align themselves along that particular path and that is how these uh, pillar like structures are actually formed so i am I'm, i'm again not going into the very technical details but just to give you a brief idea gravitational force itself is responsible for all such structures so there are different kinds of uh, structures which you will see in the universe it's uh, not always pillar like structures are formed uh, different there are heart shaped nebula there is crab shaped nebula there are many other different structures as well okay so depending on how the gravitational force between these um, gas molecules uh, is there uh, different shapes are formed in the universe okay shall we move on uh Ishan is asking, uh, like we use sonar to map the ocean. Why don't we use gravitational waves to map the universe? We are actually doing it. We are using gravitational waves to map the universe. And uh, maybe it's it's been just a month, not even a month, I guess. Uh, recently, gravitational waves were detected. Uh, nanohertz of the or the frequency of nanohertz. and you must have read in the newspapers or article somewhere that nanohertz gravitational waves were detected and india had a very important role to play uh, in the detection so if you just try to uh, search for uh, something like npta which is indian pulsar timing array you just try to put it on google and you'll see that india has played a uh, very large contribution in detecting these nanohertz gravitational waves and these waves are definitely being used or uh, to map our universe uh, one more question if how can we say that space is vacuum yeah. if so many gases are present in the universe okay so this uh, these gases these are not uniformly distributed okay these are distributed according to some structure okay uh, maybe for now we can consider that these gases are distributed randomly but most of this uh, most of the space is vacuum okay and we are able to tell 
this based on observations using various telescopes, uh, various space-based missions, ground-based missions, we have been able to map uh, the structure of our universe. And what we have found out that most of the space uh, is made up of vacuum and only a small portion of the space uh, is made up of material. Okay. So I guess that answers your question. And let's uh, move ahead since we are short of time. And uh, we'll look at this image, uh, which is the image captured by JWST. And this is a planetary nebula. The name of this uh, planetary nebula is the Southern Ring Nebula. So how is it different from the planetary nebula? So the previous nebula that we saw, that is the neb that is the region where stars were getting formed. In this particular planetary nebula, this has nothing, nothing to do with planets. The name somehow got stuck. But in case of a planetary nebula, we, it is a region where stars die. The planetary nebula is a region where stars actually die. So in the image you are seeing, uh, in this uh, slide you are seeing actually two images. And these are the image, images of the same nebula. The left image is in the, uh, is captured by Miri. I guess so. And uh, sorry, this the left image is captured by NIRCAM which is the near infrared camera, which I told you. And the right image is captured by Miri. I'm still very not sure, but I guess you can uh, Google and confirm whether I'm, I'm right or not. So the left image is captured in a different wavelength. The right image is captured in a different wavelength. And we are able to identify different, uh, as you can see, uh, let me just point out that when you observe at the left image, you are able to see a central star here. And this star is actually dying. So when a star dies, it explodes. And when it explodes, it uh, emits all kind of material energy. And this actually gas that you are seeing is the uh, basically the elements which are let out in this explosion. So you are seeing a single star here. But now when you are observing using a different wavelength region, you are actually seeing double stars. Here. So these are not, this is not a single star. It is a double star system, binary star system, which is actually dying and it dies in the form of an explosion, which we call it as a super, uh, as a planetary nebula explosion. Okay. And luckily or co coincidentally, we'll say a galaxy was also captured uh, when this image was taken. So when you, it, it, it also happens sometimes you try to observe some, some object and something else gets observed, observed as well. Okay. So let's briefly look at the evolution of a star. I'm not going to go into the various uh, mathematical details again, uh, but generally a, when a star evolves, it evolves in uh, three, uh, it can take three different paths of evolution. It can take three different paths of evolution. Okay. So smaller stars, smaller stars as in stars like the sun. Okay. Like sun they follow this particular path, the first part. Okay. So they grow in size and just before their death, they explode as a planetary nebula. And finally they become this object, which is called the white dwarf. This is a white dwarf. White dwarf because it has become a very small star. Now it has died and that is why the name white dwarf. Okay. But now bigger stars, bigger stars, very bigger stars than the sun, they then take two different paths. Okay. So first they grow in size, they become red giants. Red giants are very massive, uh, uh, very huge stars. And then just before their death, they explode. This ex uh, just like the planetary nebula explosion, they explode. This kind of explosion is called a supernova explosion. And then they uh, either become this neutron star. This is a neutron star or they become black holes. And this is nothing but a supernova explosion. Supernova. Okay. So now how this supernova explosion is different from the planetary nebula explosion. Uh, actually the elements that are released, they are also different, but this supernova explosion is very much powerful compared to this planetary nebula explosion. Okay. So for example, let us assume there is a galaxy here. Okay. And this galaxy is made up of billions of stars. Okay. Now if our telescope or our own eyes, maybe if we are observing uh, this particular galaxy, 
will be able to collect some intensity of light coming from this galaxy okay and for now no star has uh, no star has exploded so our telescope will record some intensity of light but let us assume a very big star it has it is now in the process of dying so what will happen it will explode so now when this uh, explosion will take place this explosion it will be very bright it will be so bright in some cases that light coming from other different all the other stars will be smaller compared to the uh, light coming from this one single star okay may not be smaller but almost of the comparable intensity so this one sing one single star's explosion is so powerful that is it is able to dominate light from all the other billions of stars so this is this is how powerful this supernova explosion can be okay and based on the size of the star again smaller stars comparatively they become neutron stars and bigger stars comparatively they become black holes okay so now let us try to understand what are black holes because this is a very fancy word and i guess most of you would be interested in understanding what a black hole is right so let us try to understand black hole so as i pointed out very big stars when they die they first explode as a supernova and finally uh, something remains which is called a black hole okay but let's try to understand black holes from a different point of view so suppose you are standing uh, on the surface of earth so let us say this is the earth okay and you are standing on the surface of it and you are holding a ball in your hand what will happen if you throw the ball upward the ball will go up some distance and it will again come back it will go to a certain height and it will come back what if now you try to throw the ball with some more velocity it will go to a higher height and it will come back but if you somehow devise a technology with which you are able to throw the ball with a velocity of 11.2 km per second if you are able to devise some technology with which you are able to throw this ball with a speed of 11.2 km per second what will happen the ball will actually go out and never come back so this particular number 11.2 km per second is called the escape velocity of the earth escape velocity of the earth so in the first two cases why was the ball coming down it was basically because of the gravitational force of the earth so this if we provide sufficient energy to the ball it will it is able to escape the gravitational influence of the earth and that is why this number is called the escape velocity of the earth okay and this escape velocity is independent of the mass of the object so whether you are you want to throw a ball or whether you want to throw a rocket you'll have to launch all objects with the speed of 11.2 km per second if you want the objects to escape the earth okay now let us assume we are hypothetically standing on the surface of the sun now we all know that sun is more massive than earth and it has a stronger gravity right so if we are standing on the surface of the sun hypothetically and we now try to do this experiment what will happen we'll have to throw at a much larger velocity because 11.2 km per second this velocity will not be sufficient sun has a different escape velocity i don't remember the number but it is definitely much greater than 11.2 km per second so to throw an object outside the sun's influence it will uh, take us a lot we'll have to give a lot more velocity okay now imagine you are standing on the surface of a black hole okay now imagine you are standing on the surface of a black hole so now if you want to do this experiment again so what will happen you are standing on the surface of a black hole hypothetically and now you want to throw something out so black holes have such a strong gravitational force that not even light cannot escape from it that even light cannot escape from it and you we know that the speed of light is 3 lakh km per second okay so if you are standing with a ball in your hand on the surface of a black hole and you want to throw the ball you will have to throw at a speed which is much larger than 3 lakh km per second so not light which is the fastest object even that cannot escape the gravitational force of the black hole 
and that is why the name actually black hole so as i told you during the explanation of the ceiling fan okay if you want to look at the ceiling fan light from the ceiling fan should enter our eyes similarly if you want to look at a black hole light from the black hole should enter our eyes right but the light from the black hole is not able to come out of its surface and that is why we are not able to see a black hole and that is why the name itself black hole but then how do we know black holes exist because black holes exist because uh, they have a very strong influence of gravity around the stars which are present near it so i had uh, shown you the picture of the milky way and there was one question what is that luminous object at the center of the milky way so actually uh, apart from the luminous object there is a very super massive black hole which is present at the center of our galaxy so our let us say this is the galaxy structure that we were seeing and at the center is a very super massive black hole okay and this super massive black hole is trying to attract all the stars around it so there are many stars which are revolving around this super massive black hole okay there are many stars which are revolving around the super massive black hole this black hole will try to pull all the stars which are near its uh, surface and that is what is the luminous portion so the luminous portion that we are seeing is actually the stars which are getting sucked into the black hole uh, which is present at the center of our milky way galaxy i hope uh, i have cleared the doubt which was asked previously and this is how this is what the first this the first image of the black hole looks like okay so the center portion that you are seeing is actually the black hole here okay and this this outer radius is called the event horizon which is nothing but various other luminous stars which are being sucked into the black hole because of its strong gravitational force okay and as you can see this is the first image of the black hole which was captured by the event horizon telescope this image was captured by the event horizon telescope okay uh, and this black hole is at the center of a galaxy called m87 this black hole is at the center of a galaxy called m87 now what does this m stand for again it is a nomenclature question and i would like you to google it here okay and this is the second image of black hole which was taken and this black hole is the black hole of our own galaxy which is the milky way galaxy so the black hole that is present at the center of our galaxy the supermassive black hole that is particularly this black hole and it is given the name sagittarius a star because this black hole is present in the constellation of sagittarius that is why the name sagittarius a star okay uh, are there any questions pravesh yeah sujay we have questions uh, with such a massive structure at the center of our galaxy how can our galaxy expand how can our galaxy expand okay so our galaxy is not expanding our universe is expanding as in uh, so there must have been a confusion that our galaxy is expanding no the answer is our galaxy is not expanding so let us say that there are many small small galaxies or even bigger galaxies there are few galaxies which are present in this form so these galaxies are actually moving away from each other okay and that is what the expansion is the galaxies themselves are not growing in size the galaxies are moving away from each other and that is what we are calling as the expansion of the universe uh, the next question is if uh, even light can't escape the black hole then how can we see the black hole shouldn't they appear fully black or invisible yeah so actually they are appearing black so as you can see this is the center portion of the this is actually the black hole right so it is appearing black because we are not able to see it we are only able to see the boundary region of the black hole which are which is consisting of stars okay which are getting sucked into the black hole so once the stars enter the uh, event horizon or the uh, what what we can say an imaginary surface those objects will become invisible so that is why it took a lot of effort to detect black holes because they are not directly visible okay and this first image of black hole was i think captured in 2017 or 19 itself so it's not been long that the black holes were detected uh, black holes were predicted somewhere uh, around the beginning of 19th century maybe the first decade or second decade 
so it took more than 100 years for us to detect the black hole they they were predicted almost 100 years ago so of course it was a very difficult task because light does not come out from black hole so we had to use very indirect methods to detect black holes uh any more questions kavish yeah we can address them later okay we are almost uh, end, uh, near the end of the talk now let us quickly look at few other images so this is the image of jupiter which was shared by jwst and as you can see uh, the telescope is so powerful that it is able to detect various features on the surface of the planet you are able to see the northern lights as well uh, so you have heard of northern lights that happen that take place uh, at the poles of the earth right similar a phenomenon happens at the poles of the jupiter as well these are the northern lights of jupiter or we can call them as aurorae and we are able to see the small features on the surface of the planet as well and this particular feature is the a great red spot which is present on the surface of the planet which is nothing but a cyclone or a hurricane you can call it which is happening at the uh, surface of jupiter uh, further another image uh, which was captured by jwst of jupiter as well in this image you are again able to see the aurora the great red spot and few of the few features but you are now also able to see the uh, satellites of jupiter that is the moons of jupiter and you are also able to see the rings around jupiter okay so that is how powerful this telescope is uh next this is the picture of uranus and the rings of uranus are uh, uh actually yeah the rings of uranus are actually very distinctly visible uh, in this particular image and mm, yeah and in the next image we we can see uranus up along with its moons as well okay so uranus is very far from jwst which is still able to clearly identify its moon as well as the rings of the jupiter and also few features on the surface of uh, of uranus and uh, with this uh, we have uh, completed the talk if you have a few more questions we can take up and then there are a few announcements about our upcoming talk so i'll like everyone to wait until that are there any questions pravesh uh yes how is gravity able to affect the time closer to the dense object slower the time goes on um i didn't get the question could you repeat so how is gravity affecting the time i mean uh, the denser object affect the time it it makes it slow down yeah how is it affecting uh, that is a very difficult question to answer but gravity uh, as i told you in the previous uh, uh, exact diagram of gravitational lensing that gravity uh, the massive uh, because of the strong mass of the uh, galaxy cluster and because of the strong gravity it is able to bend space okay around it but it does not just bend space it also bends uh, time as well so it's very difficult to explain what bending of time is or what Uh, how it affects uh, time in in the usual sense but uh, when when you try to approach a very massive or very dense object uh, the time with which uh, the clocks that we uh, use to record time they start affecting okay our uh, entire all the motions that we carry on for example breathing the heart rate everything that uh, is happening within our bodies that also starts getting affected and that also uh, like uh, the pace of all those activities also it goes on decrease but how that happens it's it's a difficult question i am not sure it has been uh, identified properly uh, but yeah that is all i can answer for that question there is one doubt here uh, it is not about the detection of the black hole if we if we know the black hole suck all the light then how can we see that orange light near the black hole uh sorry uh if black hole suck all the light then how can we see the orange light near the black hole okay so as i told you black holes have certain boundary okay where the gravitational force is very strong the gravitational force decreases as the distance from the black hole increases okay so if you go farther and farther away from the black hole the gravity goes on decreasing and there is a point at which the black hole is not able to suck light 
so that is the region from which light is actually coming to us so in this particular image you see the black hole's gravity is influential up to this particular radius once we come out of this particular radius uh, the black hole's gravity is becomes weak and it is not able to suck the light outside this radius so we are able to see the uh, light that is up to uh, we are able to see collect light that is some uh, distance away from the center of the black hole that boundary is called event horizon and that is why also the name of the telescope was given event horizon telescope the next question is can you explain the gravity in naive terms can you explain gravity in naive terms okay in the terms of relativity this is kind of a okay this is uh, okay in terms of relativity okay so what exactly is happening um, so you must have uh, come across a very famous uh, uh, various video explanations right uh, imagine you are holding a fabric a piece of cloth from its four ends maybe you can use four different people to hold so let us assume you are holding a, a sheet of let us say cloth using uh, with the help of four different people here okay and assume this is our two dimensional space okay this is a two dimensional object and assume this is a two dimensional space okay so now if we put something very heavy let us say you put a basketball inside this so what will happen the sheet will go down right this fabric will go down and that is what we are actually saying that space is getting distorted so similarly in four dimensional space time we say when a very massive object is placed in the space time it is actually distorting the space time and with this diagram i am able to only show you a two dimensional uh, curvature but this actually happens in four dimension the space the three dimension of space and the four dimension of time and if you need a better explanation i'll uh, uh, urge you to uh, look at a youtube video maybe i can share the link with you if you contact me on whatsapp later Uh, next question is uh, what is inside the black hole okay uh, so as we know nobody has gone inside the black hole and there is uh, no way as of yet uh, uh, that has been discovered to probe what is there inside the black hole because light itself is not coming from the black hole so we actually definitely don't know what actually exists inside the black hole but we can definitely predict because black hole is nothing but a dead star okay so whatever elements that were present in the star before just before its explosion whatever elements remain those are the elements um, that are supposed to be present inside the black hole but what happens to those elements once the black hole is formed nobody knows do they get converted into a different element do chemical reactions happen uh, we have no such idea as of yet uh, as to what actually is present inside the black hole. so i think it's 9 o'clock and uh, we should uh, stop and uh, before we close in uh, i would just like to tell you that uh, we are ajur with foundation uh, we are available on instagram facebook linkedin youtube we are mostly active on instagram to try so try to follow us on instagram there are some educational videos available on youtube as well so you can uh, follow us on uh, subscribe on youtube as well and let me tell you what is the upcoming webinar so our upcoming webinar is uh, supposed to happen on 6th august from 7:30 pm to 9 pm tentatively the topic is how do planets form so we have studied uh, about exoplanets we have looked at few images from the solar system itself so in the next talk we are going to explore more on planet formation how our earth other planets in the solar system and few of the planets which are outside our solar solar system how are they form and what information do exoplanets give information about the formation of earth and other planets inside the solar system so that is uh, a talk uh, which is upcoming i guess pravesh will share the link uh, in the chat box you can register by going on to the link you can also join the whatsapp group to keep yourself updated uh, with the webinar uh, with the events of ajurved foundation and uh, then next we also have speed cubing uh, or rubik's cube uh, webinar so that will be taken by my friend abhijit uh, is he available pravesh right now yeah he has joined 
Okay, so Abhijit can take over. Uh, and before that, we also have an upcoming talk on Chandrayaan three. Ah, uh, so in a as you know, Chandrayaan three was launched um just a few days back. It is supposed to uh the rover that is uh that is the the Chandrayaan three. It is going to uh land on the moon on twenty third or twenty fourth August. So on twenty seventh August, that is the Sunday of that week, we are going to have a uh have our webinar on. On on that particular event. So with this, I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll uh, hand it over to Abhijit. Uh, he'll give you a brief demo about what the uh, Rubik's Cube experiment will actually contain, consist of. So Abhijit, you can go on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hi everyone. I I hope you guys oh, enjoyed yeah. uh, the lecture that uh, Sujay gave, and you guys asked good questions towards the end. Uh, so this is an upcoming webinar. Uh, Sujay is my friend, and I've been speed giving for the last uh, ten years. So um, I would be just introducing you to how it is done, and um, so uh, uh, I'll just give a brief demo of how it's done. So there are a few thousand people who compete in competitions, and uh, currently there are seventeen events, and uh, there are four blindfold events. So. Uh, I I have I hold a national record in uh, one of these blindfold events. So um, uh, so that that gives me a bit of uh, upper edge compared to the rest of the cubers, and uh, uh, my time uh, would be uh, faster than other cubers. So yeah, I'll just give a brief demo. This is a three by three. You have other puzzles, a five by five. Uh, then there is a mega minx. Uh, like I have three hundred of them. I won't bore you with each and every shape. But there are a lot of puzzles, and only about eleven of these puzzles are allowed in a competition. And there are seventeen events out of this eleven puzzles. So yeah, I'll just mix up a uh, three by three and show you a solve. Uh, yeah, and if you guys have any doubt, you can ask. So I'm just hand scrambling first. So uh, generally in a competition, you are given a timer uh, and then you have to touch the timer and start the time. And then you, you are allowed 15 seconds to inspect the queue. So right now I'm inspecting, looking for good starts. Once you inspect the cube, you place the cube down and then you uh, start that then. Once you're done, you place the timer back. So this is how solves are done. Uh, there are a lot of competitions around India and the world. And uh, so this is nothing too serious. I did it in 10 seconds. A uh, few hundred people in India can do it. But I would be doing this uh, blindfolded. Uh, so that would be one more thing before you guys go and have dinner. So I'm again scrambling up the cube mode. I have an eye mask here which I'll be wearing hopefully uh, perfectly. And then I'm taking off my headphones because I need to memorize. So, And uh, yeah. so yeah, this is a three by three solved. Uh, it's a bit harder than solving a three by three with eyes open because you have to keep track of few things and you have to be precise. Uh, it's like shooting with a rifle and uh, three by three solving is uh, shooting with a machine gun. So both requires different skill. This is a bit harder. So yeah, there's an upcoming seminar um, and Sujay would share the details. And yeah, if I if you guys have any questions, you can ask. Uh, please tell uh, about the prerequisites, uh, Bijit. Oh yeah, yeah. So prerequisite is uh, I have cubes here. 
and uh, I would be communicating to you via uh, this cube or any cubes that I have. I'll be just showing the move. And if you do not have a cube with you, then it would be uh, tougher for you to follow uh, because uh, this thing cannot be done orally. It can barely be done online. It's better to be done in person. But yeah, I would be sharing a few uh, websites through which you can get the cube. Uh, there is still time before uh, the workshop happens. Get a cube, uh, get familiar with the notations, uh, use Google and YouTube and get familiar with speed cubing. And by the time the webinar starts, I hope you guys have uh, good questions to ask and uh, just not the basic questions. Basic questions ask Google and YouTube and advanced question ask me. Anything else? Okay. Thank you, Abhijit. Uh, so let's all, uh, I request everyone to please turn on their uh, video cams so that we can click a screenshot and post it on our social media platforms. So can you please all turn on your videos? We'll do a quick photo session. Yeah. Nice to see you all. Can you all please place the camera in front of your faces and give a beautiful smile? Yes, Abhijit, uh, Pravesh, can you please try to take a few screenshots? Are we done? Uh, okay. Abhijit has taken a few screenshots. Pravesh, have you? Yeah, I have taken. Okay. Chalo. Thank you all. Thank you, Pravesh. Thank you, Abhijit. It was, and thank you, audience. It was nice interacting with you all. And we'll see you soon in our upcoming webinar.